eBay Motors is here for the ride. Elbow grease and a whole lot of love transformed 100,000 miles and a body full of rust into a drive entirely its own. LED headlights, spoilers, whatever you need. eBay Motors has it at affordable prices. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride every time. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. Thanks for listening to CarCast on Podcast One. I'm not going very far. It's too uncomfortable. I'm in a hurry. Sometimes I just forget. There's no such thing as a good excuse for not buckling up. You're not only putting yourself at risk of injury or death, it could also cost you lots of money. Cops are writing tickets, so why take the risk? Do the smart thing and start buckling up every trip, day or night. Click it or ticket. Paid for by NHTSA. Hey guys, before we get started, I want to tell you about Dodge. This spring, the Brotherhood of Muscle is looking for new members, and the only way to join is to get behind the wheel of Dodge's only family of all-wheel drive muscle cars. The Dodge Charger, the only muscle car in its class to throw you back in your seat with 300 horsepower and still get 30 miles per gallon. You know, the Dodge Challenger, you know, the groundhog didn't see its shadow. It heard the rev of the most affordable V8 in its class. And the Dodge Journey, maximize your adventure with the most powerful third row all wheel drive vehicle in its class. And certainly the Dodge Durango. Tear through April showers with the most powerful SUV with all-wheel drive availability in its class. Hurry into your Dodge dealership and start your introduction to the Brotherhood of Muscle. Hello once again. Thank you for listening to CarCast. I am Matt, the moderator, DeAndrea, and here in the studio once again, Bill Goldberg. Hey, How are hey, you, buddy? Hey, 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 here we are. Oh, man, we've just been cranking out shows. We're having some fun. And, uh, uh, you know, last week, if you guys didn't get a chance to listen, we had a great episode with Mark Warman. We talked, we talked all about Dodge, Mopar, Dodge, Mopar, Dodge, Mopar. And uh, we just back, back and forth. What a fun guy, by the way. Couldn't I get could a finish see time why. on my damn truck, though. You know, the, one, the only reason why I wanted him on the show is to get a finish time, finish, uh, you know, a timeline on the truck. And he, he, he didn't live. We've got uh, Marcus Angel in the studios. Give us one second. We're going to get to him. But, uh, but yeah, look, by the way, it sounds like the network doesn't let you have your truck yet, but, but he might be pretty close to being done. But that's part of the, that's part of the show, right? So, it's the uh, song and dance. Um, it's, it's the world we live in. Mark Warman is working on your pickup truck, your lifted work truck. What year is that truck? 99 Dodge 2500 ramp. And, uh, and he's doing a, he's doing a, a a hemi swap into Mopar it. performance is pretty much showing everybody that's got an underpowered ram early year yeah. like me that there's an option to put a crate motor in it plug and play that's at the end of the day what we're doing so if you guys want to hear more about that if you didn't listen to last week's episode please do go and check it out and uh, we'll kick things off first i'm going to tell you about the dodge spring sales event you hurry to the dodge spring sales event today and become the newest member of the brotherhood of muscle i feel like you've been in that that, that drive your demon while. down to the dealership and <laughs> right? pick up a track log. You know, uh, so check out this lineup, guys. We've got the Dodge Charger. You can own the road and the pump with up to 300 horsepower and 30 miles per gallon. The Dodge Challenger, as we know, has the most affordable V8 in its class. Also, probably the most powerful V8 when you start getting into the demon world. Yes. The Dodge Journey is the most powerful three-row all-wheel drive vehicle in its class. And the Dodge Durango, which your buddy Mark Warman's a fan of, he got his, right? Yes, he did. Uh, the most powerful SUV with all-wheel drive availability in its class. So your initiation to the Brotherhood of Muscle starts at your local Dodge dealership. All right. Marcus Angel. Marcus Angel is from Angel Restorations. You guys got to check out his shop. It's A-N-G-H-E-L restorations.com. He's located in Scottsdale, Arizona. And uh, specializing in early Mustangs, especially the 69 and 70 Concourse Mustangs, the Cobra Jet Shelby's Boss Cars. Uh, This is perfect for me. Uh, We did an entire week about Mopars with Warman last week, and now we're going to get into Mustangs. The beauty of it is is my buddy Bill has the coolest Mustang out there. Uh, We've been talking about your Lawman Mustang for a while now. 
And but uh, you're a Mustang guy too. I am a Mustang guy. Um, uh, I I don't have anything that you're working on, uh, uh, Angel. Um, I have uh, I have a couple ninety three Mustang Cobras, and you know there's SEMA builds as well. We're really kind of hoping that we may actually do something at SEMA this year, Bill and I, teaming up with some of our friends at, like, MagnaFlow and whatnot. Right. And if we uh, get the uh, the stars to align, we might show both of our cars. Uh, just hoping they'll all be done by then. <laughs> and uh, uh, yours is going to be easier than mine. Maybe we'll bring those cars yeah, to SEMA. Know. I we'll, thought we'll, it was going to be, but no. <laughs> you know, um, And we'll get into uh, – maybe we'll show those cars. We'll do some podcasting down there. Either way, I'm pretty sure we're going to be at SEMA having a good time down there as well. So the Lawman Mustang, let's back up a little bit. Let's tell us – just give us a little recap about this car, the history of this car, and – uh, we know that Bill bought it at auction years ago. I don't even know if you were there. No, I was in Japan. Uh, Bob Johnson called me at 3 o'clock in the morning and said, Hey, man, you ought to see this car they brought on stage. They started up and blew all the plants off of it. <laughs> like, hey, dude, it's 3 o'clock in the morning. Did you get me my Yanko Camaro? Yeah, we got you that one, but this car is called the law. And right before he even got anything else out, I said, buy it. Period. End of story. I don't care. Just buy it. Yeah. And uh, the rest is kind of history. And you've had right? it. And when was that? Conti- That's been years ago. God, that was uh, ugh, two, 2000, I think it was. Yeah, 2000, wow. 2001, two, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, Marcus, tell us about your shop. What is it that you guys do? I mean, we're talking about the restorations on the Mustangs, but uh, what's... W- Before he gets into it, I'm just going to say, if you've got the baddest Mustang on the planet, who do you get to restore it? Right, the yeah. baddest Mustang restorer on the planet. Yeah, yeah. it can't go. Be. The yeah. door's open for yeah, you. There you go. All right, thanks, thanks. Uh, so, f- first of all, Bill, Matt, thanks for having me on here. The Lawman Project is probably something that I've been chasing after for a couple years now. Right, in our world, in the Mustang world, in the vintage Mustang world, the Lawman it has a little bit of everything. It's got the history. It's one of a kind. And I mean, I've in the last few weeks, I've heard from people all over the world. Um, it's everything that you'd ever want from my point of view as a restorer, and from Bill's point of view as a collector. It's everything, right? It's it's and it's great because it has a great history behind it. We, there's a lot of cars out there, but a history like this, I I've never come across anything. like And as it. he's talking about it, the hair's standing up on my arms. <laughs> it's the Goldberg of muscle it, it, cars, though. When you think it, about it, it, it is. It's just it it's is. the big brute with the huge supercharger, and it just makes crazy loud, power. obnoxious it's in your loud. face. I get it. I get <laughs> it. I didn't say any of that stuff. I didn't say any of that stuff. The good and the bad of Goldberg. <laughs> well, it's it's the right guy with the right car. I mean, uh, I'm glad that Bill has it. Um, I've I've always I think. From back in the day, I have uh, articles from it, and I've always kept those, and, you know, I feel really privileged that I'm working on the car. So part of the working on the car, right, is obviously we got to go through and do a lot of background detail on it right yeah. now. First of all, tell us, what, what's the year? What's the power plant? Paint, paint a picture for those who haven't seen the car yet. Okay. It's a... Uh, it's a 1970 Boss 429, um, but what Ford did is they put a blower on this thing, and basically built it for uh, exhibition, drag racing, and to say, hey, this is what we can do. If we really wanted to, we could build a car like this. And it's it's everything. I mean, it's got the parachute on the back. Uh, you put your damn seat belts on, and you hang on. I mean, it's got a roll bar in it. It's it's really And it impressive. does mean seat belts. <laughs> yeah. Not harnesses. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's... Um, it's impressive. I mean, when you see that, um, you know, sticking out of the um, out of the hood, right? It's you right away. Like, what is this thing, right? Big bold letters on the side, Lawman, right? Lawman, uh, which pays tribute to um, uh, Al Ekstrand, which was the guy that uh, worked with Ford to develop this program. So, um, and I could go into that if you if we want to do that now, or yeah, yeah, yeah. tell us about it. Okay, so. Um, it's an interesting thing, right? Ford, there's two things to look at. Ford in 1970 came up with this idea with Al to say, okay, we're going to go overseas to these different bases, Vietnam, Japan, uh, European theater as well, and show the troops what the cars and what's going on back home, right? The muscle cars. I mean, you got these young guys over there, 
they're uh, serving, and they want to see, you know, a little bit of home, and, and nothing's, I mean, to me, if I was in that time, there'd be nothing better than, hey, we're doing this exhibition today, we got a bunch of Mustangs, you could drive them. And there's also the other aspect, that, you know, from the marketing point of view, that these guys could order cars. So after they do this and look at these things, it's like, oh, hey, well, you know, you can buy a Mustang as well and order it. When you get back, it's it'll be waiting for you at the dealer because in the end, Ford sells cars, right? So that was um, that was the program that this car and uh, the drivers and Al were involved in, um, and it was um, it was really something unique back then. And Ford, you know, took a hold of it, and obviously it was a PR move, right? But yeah, part of my connection, a lot of my connection with this car is to the man who did the program, Al Ekstran. Ekstran didn't do it for publicity. He didn't do it for money. He did it from the goodness of his heart to make sure that the servicemen who were putting their lives on the line for our freedom – came back and had the knowledge to control a car with 400 horsepower you know at the end of the day that that's that's what the tour meant to him that was it period end of story you know and you know taking to the vas and the guys who couldn't come out guys and girls who couldn't take part in the program they could you know wheel themselves up to the window and look at that lawman as it's hauling ass down the tar i mean you know it, it it brought back the red white and blue yeah yeah and even today, right? Because Bill has done a lot of stuff uh, over the years here where it's such an interesting thing, right, to see people that come forward and say, I remember that, right? I know about this. Maybe I've seen it. Maybe I haven't seen it before. But to be standing there in front of this car and the history that surrounds it, it's uh, it's a really interesting thing. And that's ultimately that's what our goal is, right, to bring this car back, back to original as it was back in 1970, and then be able to show it at different venues that uh, Bill picks out. And, and I think in the end we'll also have a booklet on the car that people uh, can read the whole history on. So it'll, it'll be really good. So you guys are working on it now. I, I, like you said, uh, Bill, you've driven it several times. You've taken it to at events, the different military bases, drag race a little bit. I'm sure it's a handful. I don't even know if it goes straight. <laughs> it goes straight. It's a handful. But it's, it, you know— it's hard for me to even comment on it without getting emotional, man. Yeah. It's really the coolest thing I've ever been associated with. Um, I've had a lot of opportunities in my life, whether it be in a wrestling career, whether football, whatever it is. But the stars aligned, and there's a reason why I own this vehicle. Mm-hmm. And um, at the end of the day, these cars are nothing you know, but, but metal, right, and rubber. And, but th- th- this car has got so much that it stands for. There's such a responsibility with this car. It's 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 not just a vehicle. It's it's a piece of Americana. Yeah. You know, it really is and we have a responsibility to get it out there. If my only motivation is to get it to people who actually saw it back in the day before they pass away, then that's motivation enough for me. So the status of the car now is what? It had a blown motor or some issue, wasn't making the power. Why make the decision now to start uh, doing some work on it? What well, did the it car, the car had been sitting for a long period of time. Yeah. You know, uh, Ford and I redid the tour. Uh, my career kind of took off a little bit again, and I, I just I got to the point where I just let the car sit. And um, – <laughs> I got a lot of cars at the at the garage, at right, Goldberg right. Garage. And you get right? busy. That's and, how you can and, afford and, and cars. You, get you, gotta get, you gotta stay busy. Yeah, you get busy, but then when you go out there and you look at these cars and you think about where the car's been, it takes you to yesteryear and you think about, you know, well, the clock's kind of ticking right now, you know. Um is, is there somebody that could enjoy this car and get more out of it and have it bring back their childhood as opposed to you when it's sitting in the garage? I'm not saying that about the lawman, but all the cars in general. Mm-hmm. So when you when you go out there and you assess what's going on and where you are and what your responsibilities are and what you can realistically attain, this is first and foremost at the at the beginning of my list. Um, it's yeah. been sitting dormant for way too long. I over revved it on the last uh, tour that we did, and there's some issues with the motor. Uh, we tore it down. We, you know, we removed it from the car, tore it down a bit, and and you know identified some issues and he's rectifying it and the, I, I, just, I don't want to put words in his mouth but the the biggest part of this of this process is 
the backstory. It's finding out how the car was so that we can replicate it to the T. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. And I it's mean, been in varying varying conditions with varying equipment throughout the years. And that's the toughest part is to find out what it originally came with from CarCraft and duplicate that. Right. Marcus, how much did you know about the car already or or – or how much research are you do, are you doing? I imagine this whole project starts with research. You get the car yeah. and you start taking it apart a little bit and starting trying to identify what's been original, what's been modified over the years or fixed. You know, you you go out there, you're 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 showing the car, you're racing the car, things break, things get, you know, uh, uh, fixed over the years, like any any race car, even street yeah. car. But we've seen this with a bunch of the race cars that we st- restore all the time. Some race car may come in and it may have you know Paul Newman's name all over it, but you're like, I just don't know why none of this looks right. And you realize yeah. the right side suspension is completely different with the left. It was scavenged for parts, and now there's stuff bolted onto it just so it'll roll around. So you don't really know where to go from there. So you're doing what? You're digging into the research portion of it? Yeah, so I the research portion... It takes a bit, right? So the way I'm doing it right now is I'm doing two things. The research, because the car could sit for a little bit, but the motor we're working on already. So the research, what we need to figure out is the way it was day one. Now, there's a lot of um, different pictures and things that I'm collecting now. Um, There's some pictures I'm looking at today that uh, Bill brought along. The story, if you go a little bit back further, there's actually two of these that they built. So one of them was destroyed in transport. I just have to make sure that the pictures that we have are of this car, not of the other car. Because my feeling, without looking into it that much further yet, is it's possible one of those was a four-speed, maybe. And this one was an automatic. I'm not 100% sure on that yet, but... You know, at the end of the day, if you're going to, I'd do the sure rest love of- for that to be the case. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, God. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know for sure, um, but you know, there's. Uh, <coughs> I'll, I'll dig into that, right? What I'm researching now is I have some people I've reached out to in Ford uh, that hopefully will help with some paperwork that I don't have, and uh, it's important, right? It's important that before you start the disassembly and the process of okay, this is the paint scheme that we're going to do. These are the accessories that are on there that we know what it needs, what the end result is going to be, right? So that's that's one thing. On the other side is the engine, right? The engine is great. Um, the good news with the motor is it's the original motor to the car. It's stamped with the uh, serial number on there. It's original, hasn't been tampered with. And it's the original bore. It's never been opened up before. Um, I brought a souvenir so your radio (laughs) listeners can see which i know they can't really see but i brought one of the pistons along here today that um, got blown up and doing the autopsy on the motor i think what i figured out is the end result is it had the wrong camshaft in there so it had a camshaft in there for a regular 429 let's say cobra jet style motor right and this boss 429 needs a different type and what was happening the timing was off all the valves were hitting all the pistons. Wow. All eight of them are marked just a little bit. But this particular one, when it got over-revved, this imploded, and everything just kind of came apart. The block is in good condition, though. Um, what heads are on it? The the heads are the original Boss 429 heads. So they're, um, a lot of people call them a Hemi head, right? So it's similar to the uh, the Mopars, the Hemis that they had. It's an original head. I don't know if we could fix the head, so we're looking at uh, getting another head. It's on the driver's side, but it's it's pretty bad. The, the way we'd have to fix it, we'd have to kind of weld, and there's issues with doing that, so I want to kind of look at my options first, and once we do that, then we could kind of engineer the motor. Um, the goal is that you could really, you know, you could get on it. I mean, yeah. I, I'm naive about this. Are they aluminum or, or iron? They're aluminum. They are aluminum. Yeah. 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 And... Um, I you know it's hard to share photos. Uh, probably one of the things on my Instagram account, and also I'm going to create a page on the website as well that follows kind of the, the progress, the story, things like this that we talk about. I think are interesting. Uh, the hole in the piston, you know, I think that's kind of interesting as well, and it makes a good uh, 
good uh, paperweight for the desk, I think. <laughs> yeah. Look, we've we've done we've been down this road before where we've worked on a bunch of cars and especially the race cars where you you're constantly having to swap out engines and rebuild engines and things like that. There is some amount of acceptable parts that you can right. fix and some that you can replace and still have the the essence of that car. And, you know, right. something like what you're talking about, maybe you need to swap the heads yeah. on that thing and then hold on to the originals, yeah. you know, to make this thing run. Because it's more important, as Bill said, to get the car out there and to show it to people again and and sort of be the caretaker of this thing um, than it is to, to say, hey, you know, the original heads are on it, but it's never going to run again. Mm-hmm. Nobody wants that. Right, right. And, I mean, the heads, and I agree, right, Matt? The thing is the heads... Yeah, you can replace those. It's you know when you ca- talk about numbers matching and things like that in the different uh, manufacturers of cars, it's the motor, right? It's the mo- original motor is a big deal, mm-hmm. and I'm really happy that that's what we have here that we're working with and that it survived all these years. I mean, uh, at the end of the day, the car has uh, less than a thousand miles on it, but you know they're yeah, hard miles. That's hard miles. Yeah, it's <laughs> a thousand hard miles. <laughs> Not <laughs> all of them. <laughs> Right. Getting right. to the event is easier than actually doing the event, right? Right. Um, what uh, what kind of horsepower do you think this thing was making when it was built in the day? Now that you know a little bit more about the motor, maybe compression and cam and yeah. and, and how much boost it was put through, you know. I have uh, paperwork from Ford. They did a release, um, I think it was January 70. They had a press party and everything. And there's documentation there that it was around 850. Uh, the horsepower that they mentioned on here. So that's, the, that's a lot. By the way, it's, back it, then, that's tough to make that even somewhat streetable. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, I mean, it wasn't streetable, but <laughs> let, let's look at it this way. It's double what the regular street Boss 429 was being rated yeah. at. And I think we'll be every bit of that and probably a little bit more than that once it's put together. Because we'll use, you know, a lot of things have changed in 50 years. Yeah. So um, I th- I think at least will be that, if not more. Right. But hopefully a little bit easier for him to drive down to the next military yeah. base and then make some high-speed runs and then drive back. <laughs> well, that is the challenge, right? The challenge here yeah. is you want to build something that's not just show, right? Yeah. It's show and go. I mean, it needs to really, you know, I don't know. I'm Look, not going to be an advocate of opening up the parachute and going down there, but... Uh, no, it's not hooked up, so it's just... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's the it's thing. It's just for sure. Here, here's the thing. It's like these days, uh, although 800 horsepower is still an insane number, it's pretty easy for us to make 800 horsepower and be pretty streetable these days. You yeah. can go and get yourself a brand new Mustang and, and you know, the Ford Racing Performance, you know, uh, supercharger kit or anything from Roush or Kenny Bell or whatever, or, you know, Pro Charger, and you're already at 700 and change, and you haven't done right. anything except slap on a supercharger. Mm-hmm. And people who do that expect as much drivability as they did when before they put it on, right? So that that's an amazing feat. So how do we create some amount of drivability? And right. uh, honestly, look, if you made 700, 725 horsepower uh, on this motor, but it was much easier to drive and it didn't stall out and idled a little bit better, you know, that wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. And I'm sure, you know, 800 is the goal, maybe 850. Right. But as you're getting into it, also the, the the supercharger technology, this this roots type of supercharger that's on top of the motor, um, not efficient at all. <laughs> <laughs> it just you know it takes a lot of horsepower to spin it. You got to do a lower compression engine, and that eats up a lot of low end power. Yeah. I mean, these days now we can go buy a, you can go buy a brand new Corvette that's like eleven and a half or eleven one compression. They're soulless. Yeah, yeah. But I'm saying you can buy a new motor with the electronics and. Uh, uh, and and knock sensors and stuff. You can buy something that's brand new that has eleven to one compression and mm-hmm. still put a supercharger on it. Back in the day, that would be unheard of. You'd mm-hmm. be just like, well, "That's too much compression to start with," because you're building so much boost within the engine as opposed to building boost within the supercharger. Right. You know, like what we have now. Um, so it's an interesting task you guys have in front of you on on building something that's going to be powerful and fun and usable. Yeah, and I and uh, and again the, the in the context it also has to be historical, right? We want this thing to represent and look as original as possible, you know, going back in the day uh, when it was shipped out in 1970. So that's mm-hmm. that's kind of the balance 
what I have to do, um, for instance, one of the things right now with the blower is obviously when the valve and everything comes apart, it got into the blower as well. I have to get that um, restored, but it's polished. So I just need to make sure that originally this thing was polished or it wasn't before we go through that whole effort mm-hmm. to kind of make sure that, that that's as authentic as possible. So the supercharger on it now is polished, but you think there's a chance it might not have been when it was original. Like over the years, it got done. Yeah, there's, there's right? a chance. Maybe it was a little more showy. People are like, we're going to take it out. Let's polish it now. It's possible. Like, yeah. yeah. Looks good. Yeah, I it mean, looks good. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's just that little bit of extra effort that, well, before we do it, now's the time to figure that out. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to, you know, jump the gun and then somebody mm-hmm. says, hey, this is, you know, who do you think you are? We thought you were an expert, right? Now, have you guys already decided that it's going to be restored back to when it was originally built? Or is there a certain era in its timeline that you'd like to restore it back to? Because that's a thing as well, right? You could say, you know what, it was built this way, but it was more famous in seventy. 70- Three or four or six, and we're going to restore it back to that. You know, I'd because say once we get all the information, then we can make a decision as yeah. to the direction. Yeah. And I, I mean, at this point, I'm not aware. You know, the history we keep talking about here is when it was shipped overseas. When it came back, it changed hands. Um, they even changed the lettering on the car. Um, I just saw that today. Mm-hmm. So I don't think anybody recognizes the car for that. Right, it's it's got to be um, it's got to be back to that really that day one when it uh, when it shipped out. Yeah, yeah. Was it the lawman on day one or was it something else? It was the lawman on day one. Yeah, it was. Yeah. But then okay. it morphed into other things. Yeah, I don't remember what they what they were, but I remember some other name or something on it at some point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the lawman is um, is again what. The story that we want to tell, and when I tie this all together, right, because what I want to do is I want to have a nice background and work with, uh, you know, what Al Ekstrand did, but also I have to reach out to the Mopar people because there's there's also Chrysler uh, lawmen as well. I mean, this isn't just something that only existed in the Ford world. He started mm-hmm. off in Chrysler. There's cars. Um, I know that there's at least one on display in one of the museums that I have to go talk to those people. And I want to tie all that together, right? Because it's, it's paying tribute to the whole story here, right? Not to let people think it's like he developed this yeah. before and that was it. No, nope, there's there's more than that before and also after that we want to look at. Yeah, so as you're doing the research on this car and documenting as much as possible, now you have also have the responsibility of, as you're working on it, you have to document it equally as well, you know, to the right. best of your ability, so for future generations, so uh, Gage can say, this is what Dad built and uh, brought back to life, and here's all the documentation to prove it. You know, So that's, right. that's a whole other thing uh, as well. Yeah, and I mean, that's what I do with all the cars and all the, the writing that I do, um, you know, the... The background and, and teaching people this is how, you know, this is how you detail, uh, let's say, for instance, a, a Cobra Jet motor. You know, I'm trying to carry that stuff forward and uh, and do it in a way that we have something, you know, people can look back at. So um, this just plays in, it plays very well to what I've been doing. Um, you know, when I first contacted Bill, my only intention was to see the car and do a story on it. Yeah. That's right, because you you are a contributor to some of the magazines as well, Mustang Monthly and... Mustang Monthly and Mustang Times. Uh, I do a monthly column in Mustang Times that's for all the uh, the uh, Mustang Club of America owners, uh, a magazine that they put out. And then uh, I work with the guys over at Mustang Monthly. I, I basically grew up with that magazine, so I'm... I couldn't be happier to write for them. I mean, it's to me, that's a bonus. Yeah, I can see Bill's rifling through the documentation right now as we go. He's super interested. Um, uh, so speaking of month, Mustang Monthly, you guys are going to be documenting this and building up a story or something for this as well? Or, or, yeah. So in the magazine or at some point? is it, I don't know if it's going to be multiple issues um, or one sort of reveal on the whole thing, but we're it's, looking it's, forward to seeing that. Yeah, I, you know, I'm dealing um, – talking to – I think you know Rob Kinnan. Yeah. Uh, and uh, our thought is probably to kind of do different segments as we go along because it's interesting enough. It's content, yeah. right? It's good. Um, and at the end, then the, obviously at the end, that's the easy thing. Then you could do an article about it. But it's it's a nice little feature to have things as we move along. And that's uh, that's our thought process right now. 
So tell me how you got started with all of this. Where were you as a kid that you were getting into this? And you said, someday I'm going to work on Bill Goldberg's Lawman. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah. yeah. I'm sure it didn't work out like that. But. Yeah. I uh, Let's see. I, I started off in Pennsylvania. Um, I grew up out there in the Pocono Mountains, uh, which is eastern Pennsylvania. And, you know, when I grew up in the uh, in the 80s, um, the muscle cars that we're talking about, the Camaros, uh, the GTXs, the Mustangs, they were just cars that we were fixing up, right? And it was like that for a long period of time. You know, we were, you know, if you were fixing up a car, you're working in your driveway, it wasn't a cool thing. There wasn't TV shows, there wasn't radio shows about cars. It was just kind of like a, a thing people did. But I, I was drawn to that, mm-hmm. right? And... Um, my parents wanted me to become a carpenter. Uh, I said, no way. Uh, so they're like, well, you got to learn some kind of a trade. Um, so I went to school for uh, automotive technology, did a two-year degree in that, and then started working in the field, um, worked at a dealership, and then at an engine shop at nighttime. You know, I, I did my time over the years, and I used to kind of flip cars back and forth because I like all cars. You know, I'd buy a Cadillac, uh, uh, you know, yeah, just to kind of, because I liked it, right? And I'd learn everything I could, and then I'd sell it. And then I'd learn, you know, buy a, maybe a Buick, uh, you know, and and do something with that and flip it. So eventually what I decided was it, the best thing to do is just specialize in one thing. Yeah. And that's where I started with this, um, and it's just kind of taken off. It takes time, right? It takes time to break into a certain segment of anything and learn it. And, you know, there's players, there's people involved, there's these, this guy, that guy. And um, you just got to do your time, right? And if you do the best job that you can, it, it usually works out. Um, and I'm still learning every day, and uh, I'm happy with, with what I get to do. I, I really enjoy, you know. So I'm, you, I've, you dabble in all of these different brands, and you're kind of cutting your teeth on which cars you like over the years and, and yeah. whatnot. What, what, what makes you end up with Mustangs? What makes you fall in love with the Mustangs <laughs> that you... Well, it, by the way, it could have just been a business decision. It could have just been like, yeah, there's probably the most future. If no, I'm going to no, do this it, for a career, Mustangs are the way to go. I don't know. Yeah, unfortunately, it's it's a kind of a, a very black and white, because uh, I've had people ask me that question before. Uh, th- the answer is I was in Barnes & Nobles, and I was trying uh-huh. to figure out what to do, and I spent the afternoon there, and for no particular reason, I said, you know what? I like the Mustangs. I'm going to specialize. It was Mustangs or Camaros at that point. Yeah. I just uh, I decided, you know, this is really what I think I can do, and I'm not going to be spinning my wheels on this. Um, and that was it. It was from that day on. It was a very calculated, very deliberate decision to say, this is what I want to do. Um, so it wasn't something that necessarily came any other way, but it's, it's you know, inspiration comes in many different ways, and to me that was uh, that's what made sense to me. When did you decide to pack up shop in in uh, uh, back east and head to to the warm sandy yeah. hills of of Phoenix? <laughs> the warm sandy hills. Yeah, I, I, that's you, an understatement. Yeah, that's a California look at Arizona. Yeah. I was born in Arizona. I lived there for a long time. Oh, okay. yeah. My All parents right. are still out there, so I keep going back. Usually okay. in the winter, I go back. I go back three times a year. My mom. Uh, she's like she. She's like, oh yeah, he comes back for Thanksgiving, Christmas, and Barrett Jackson. <laughs> yeah. so my, three holidays. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> those, are, those are really my mom's like sort of three holidays that she recognizes. She doesn't really care that much about cars, but she talks about the event uh, Arizona Auction Week so much because she yeah. knows that's the week I'm going to be back in town. <laughs> I'll probably spend more time there during that auction week than I do for Christmas or Thanksgiving <laughs> when I hit up all the go to Gooding, go to RM. There's, go no, to, qu- there's no question. You. Right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it makes the most sense. And look, I, from a business standpoint, I would imagine like that whole area has just built up to such a big collector car world every year. There's hundreds of millions of dollars that go through there. Yeah. And a lot of these guys are storing cars out there, keeping them out there. Why? Because uh, you can still store them pretty inexpensively out there. You can build some nice facilities to store cars. Right. And nothing rusts. Nothing, Russ, and uh, I mean, the interiors are shot out here. But so, <laughs> yeah. you know, growing up on the East Coast, the only thing I can say that I think some people can connect with is uh, 
in the New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York area, everybody talks about, we're going to go to Florida. We're going to move to Florida when we retire. Yeah. I right? hate Florida. <laughs> well, just just that idea that you're going to move it. south, right? Get away from this. Yeah. And I thought, you know, I was in my 20s at the, that point, and I said, why the hell am I, why would I wait till I'm in my 60s to go someplace I want to be? I And I was always drawn to California as a kid, always. The first trip I ever did was California. Um, and, well... Arizona was the closest thing because when you look at, you know, from an outsider, it's like, oh, I want to buy a house and uh, move to California. And uh, uh, how much is the house? Uh, you're just baffled by how yeah. people live out here. So Arizona was the next best thing. I could drive to San Diego, L.A., Vegas from there. And I settled there in uh, in 1998, and um, I hated it because I moved in August. And it was two weeks later that I, I called the mover. I'm like, I, I got to get me out of here. I just, this is ridiculous. <laughs> I, I, but I settled in. The, the temperatures changed. The winter came in. And um, that was in um, 1998. So um, it'll be coming up on, in August on 20 years. Yeah. And after that, I never looked back. I, I love the West Coast, everything about it. Um, you know, the I spend a lot of time in Oregon now. I go back and forth. Um, I mean, everything about it. The, it's it's to me the best place to be. And I I've come by accident to appreciate Arizona with the car culture there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I have a junkyard behind the shop. We have a dozen cars back there, which you can't do out here. Yeah, which you don't have the space for probably. Yeah, you can't do that out here. I was born in Arizona, and my People ask me all the time, like, how did you end up there? How were you born there? And I would, my parents are from the East Coast. I would say, well, they were driving to California, and the car overheated, yeah. and they got <laughs> stuck there. And 13 years <laughs> later, I finally escaped. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that was, that was pretty, much, uh, pretty much it. But, yeah, the car culture out there is, is impressive, uh, to say yeah. the least. And, uh, and in January, right? In January, yeah. it all comes to a head in January. <laughs> It's fantastic, right? I have an open house every year in January. I have a couple hundred people that come to the shop, but they don't come there because it's me. They come there because they're there for the auctions. The timing's good. You know, we have a food truck. It's a. It's just, it's the right place to be. If I was somewhere in, you know, in the middle of Iowa, I don't think anybody would be coming and visiting for, for an open house out there. Yeah. But, um, the auctions, I've really come to appreciate that. I didn't understand it when I first moved uh, to Arizona. Bill is so enamored with all the paperwork that he's <laughs> he's going through. Did you find anything interesting in there? <laughs> Dude, everything in here is interesting. It's just tons of photos and black and whites and old receipts and things like that. And this is here's, here's but this or- is kind of what's fun about the project. Here's an original photo of yeah. the one that oh, was crushed. Oh man, that one is crushed. I love everybody sitting on it. Like I'm looking at a photo. It's a black and white photo, and the roof is hitting the seats because it's squished. Yeah. That's rough. Yeah. They all got cool jackets on those guys. Um, we're going to be uh, we're gonna be doing this um, worth this thing with our friends over at Evans Cooling. I'm going to tell you guys about. So uh, check this out. So we know that water is bad for metal, right? Unless you're in Arizona, uh, water is bad for metal, and that's nothing new. The water in your coolant is ruthless, though. It rusts and corrodes metal. It has a low boiling point, and when it vaporizes, it builds pressure inside your cooling system. That's when you get boil over and burst hoses. To prevent the damaging effects of water, the guys at Evans Waterless Coolant have developed the only waterless coolant on the market. In the next couple of weeks, we're going to be having the guys from Evans on the show to discuss this revolutionary product and how it works. You may or may not be familiar with the idea of waterless coolant, so write to us. Or you could use hashtag waterless101 to send in your questions or comments about the product. Um... What we want you to do is you go to evanscoolant.com forward slash fight back, and you can submit questions there. We want to get your questions answered on the show by the Evans guys themselves. So check out their website at evanscoolant.com forward slash fight back, and be sure to send your questions in. These guys want to answer that hard stuff you may be wondering about this product. That's evanscoolant.com forward slash fight back to fight back against the water in your coolant. So check that out and we'll put the link up on our website as well. So I know you guys go to car cash show. You want to see some pictures. We'll take pictures of the blown piston that we brought over and stuff. Um, and we'll link to the, to this, uh, Evans coolant guys as well. So if you don't remember that URL, URL, you can always go to car show.com. But, um, 
Uh, but send us in whatever you're doing with these guys. I was thinking about it as well. I'm running a, a BMW M3, and I have a, a an air to water intercooler, um, and I never thought to swap out the water and coolant for just straight up waterless coolant like Evans cooling. And I'm curious if that would that would change the temperature. So that's my question for them. So maybe we'll see if that works. But um, um. Marcus, so what else are you working on? Uh, and I know Bill's sitting right there. So, <laughs> hey man, we you know here here we touched on this the yeah. Mormon show about timing, right? This is a different project. This, this is, is a big a project. project. There's, there's this so much is, history. This in, is a different and, deal. I, um, you know the the only issue with timing is we just want to get it out there as soon as we can, so that the people who are you know, on the yeah. fence right now can see it before they're gone. That's the only time limit on this thing. It's got to be done right, period, end of story. You're right. It, it comes down to the research, but at some point, like a car like this, you can keep digging and digging and digging and calling some people that might have been around back in the day, like you're saying, yeah. and get different stories from them. And there's kind of no end to it. So at some point, you have to kind of give yourself a self-imposed uh, deadline for something like this, or at least to the point where you feel confident enough to move forward and make some decisions about it. Um, so hopefully uh, you guys are, are working that stuff out. I know the car was just sent over. Yeah. Um, like you said, you're digging into the engine now because that is something you can start working on. Um, you know, maybe it's a search for heads or one head or a new set of heads that will work on this. Or, or you know, do you got to have something made? Who knows what? And uh, designing a cam spec and, yeah. you know, doing some doing some uh, some dyno work or something like that. And, of course, you want to make the car safe as well. Like where are you on brakes? Are those brakes going to be sufficient for using the car? And if here's you're, the, the, if you're not going to use you, the parachute, you touched on brakes. Bra- yeah. Tell them about the rear brakes. That's, here's just another example of what yeah. we're the having rear, to do the, here. The rear brakes, I haven't taken them apart yet, but the there is disc brakes on the rear of the car, which is truly uh, unique and unusual for a uh, a sixty nine seventy Mustang. They specifically did it for that car. I looked at it a little bit closer. They used uh, front brake hoses that they uh, strapped to the rear end uh, for some reason. Oh, interesting. But it's it's an interesting setup, and uh, I didn't think it was original, but then I found a picture of the crushed car, and the wheel is off of it, and you could see it has exactly the same uh, brakes on the on the back. So okay, so but what decisions do you make? On going, all right. So we're gonna we're gonna do a hard line on the rear brakes, and or we're gonna do some sort of braided line See, somewhere. That, that's like, the issue right there. We you know, gotta figure out. I mean, you've you've got to make some calls as to how to make the car <laughs> safe and and able to use and and things yeah. like that. Well, it's like, like what we did with the radiator. Yeah. You know, we re- relocated the radiator and brought it up to you know 2016 specs. Once we redid the car a little bit, you know, so that I could take it out and damn thing wouldn't overheat in three seconds um so you look at different advancements in technology but then you weigh that against originality function over form it's a i think there is a compromise i especially if you're going to use the car and and i think there is a scenario where you know it you know the the car was probably fairly unsafe to begin with. I mean, you're showing me pictures of a crushed one, so at some point we can prove it was unsafe, uh, or the other one that was out there. Uh, so at some point, what do you do? Like, you've got to make some acceptable modifications. Yeah. To make it work. I'm not saying, hey, swap it to fuel injection and put an independent rear in the back. I ain't I'm, modifying uh, shit. You know let's, just put it, let's just put it right there yeah, right now. It, I ain't modifying shit to make it safer. It's yeah. not, I'm not adding technology to this car it it it, it's going to be duplicated the way that it was we have to find out how it was yeah um get it back to that state and then use it to the best of our ability within those constraints i'm not i'm not updating the car yeah and i think that's a good summary is that uh Mm -hmm. (coughs) you know the i i would I really wouldn't think that either. It's not. It, I don't know that it has to be updated to. You know, the brakes are fine. I mean, trust me, disc brakes on the back of a Mustang. That's that. That's great. I mean, it's going to stop. I mean, the the normal configuration, non Boss four twenty nine, was drum brakes on the front of a Mustang in nineteen seventy. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Oh, you wanted to upgrade? Okay. I mean, I, I get a lot of cars in the shop where it's like, yeah, it's, somebody must have changed. It's like, no, this this came this way. It had drums on the front, and it, yeah. it's terrible, you know. So 
things like that, you can upgrade and put time correct, you know, period correct parts back on there. But um, I think we'll be fine in that aspect, right? We yeah. want it to go. We want it to stop and uh, be dependable. Yeah. All so right. Well, we'll, we'll see. I mean, time frame wise, I, I know it's not going to be done for SEMA. I, I heard that in the beginning of the show. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to be clear on that. But we could wave the piston around and show people that. <laughs> right. I think the, I'm going to keep that one to myself. Yeah, the uh, the engine <laughs> might be done for SEMA, but that's going to be about it. And some of the research will be done. Yeah. All right. Well, Marcus Angel, thanks for coming in. It's angelrestorations.com, and it's A-N-G-H-E-L restorations.com. Uh, he's, in, uh, he's in Arizona. He's in Scottsdale? In Scottsdale. Yeah, he's in Scottsdale. Uh, check out his shop um, and look forward for uh, a lot more discussion about this car and hopefully some upcoming articles in, Muth- in Mustang Monthly about it as well. Um, uh, guys, you can check me out at Motorator. I'm on uh, Instagram, Twitter, and, uh, and Facebook, all at Motorator. And you can find Goldberg. Uh, on Twitter at Goldberg and Goldberg Garage on Twitter and Goldberg95 and Goldberg's Garage on Instagram. Always good places to follow the builds, what's going on. I know we didn't touch on uh, for a little while the, the Demon Project, but the thing with the HRE wheels, the Magnaflow exhaust, and all the great stuff on that car. You want to see it, check out all of his social media as well. Um, guys, thanks you, thank you again for coming in, for Marcus and Bill. Until next time, keep the air and the spare and the bag and the wheel. Hoo-ah!